May I speak in the name of God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Many of you will be aware that Canon Janet, Janice and I were at the Bishop's Conference last week, a time intended for refreshment and restoration, and after a particularly busy few weeks, very much appreciated. It was an opportunity to step back, take a breath and recenter ourselves in Christ. To help us do this, Bishop Rowan Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, led some reflections on the Beatitudes, the teachings of Jesus that form part of the Sermon on the Mount, which go, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, blessed are those who mourn, and so on. Some of you will be quite familiar with them, and have perhaps sat through quite a few sermons with the preacher trying to wrangle some meaning out of them. But listening to Bishop Rowan's own ponderings on them got me thinking about healing and wholeness, which of course our Bible passages speak of today. Now, the meaning of the Beatitudes is more complicated than may seem on first reading, and I'm not going to go into details here. But suffice to say that people and situations listed in the Beatitudes aren't blessed in themselves. It's not a good thing to be poor or mourning or in pain or oppressed and so on. But once all our power is taken away in those situations, the freedom, the health, the wealth, the other things that make us feel secure, perhaps that's when we begin to see God more clearly. That's when true healing and wholeness really start to come about. When we become unencumbered by our own sense of being in control. And as we shed that skin of self-centeredness, as our vulnerabilities surface, our eyes are opened to seeing God and his saving grace in us and all around us. That's when we catch glimpses of the kingdom. We become more attuned to God. Perhaps that's what it means by being blessed. Let's consider how this is illustrated in our readings. Our gospel reading is a very graphic example of physical healing. At first sight, it's quite straightforward. A man is possessed by demons and Jesus heals him. No longer a social outcast, the man gets dressed and returns to the community that shunned him. But notice how the people who witness this react. Are they full of joy, delighted that one of their own has been not only made well, but also restored to his rightful place in society? No, they were afraid. I too would probably be a bit freaked out if I saw demons leap from a person into pigs which then ran into a lake. But this is much more than that. Jesus is upsetting the balance of power. The physical healing bit is probably fine in itself, but it's another matter altogether that Jesus gives this outcast dignity, breaking down the bar barriers so he regains his equality. Society is being reordered. This is uncomfortable. People are starting to wonder who's in charge here. We might wonder the same thing. If we're needing to live by Christ's rules rather than our own or they, those laid down by society, what does that mean for us? Paul, in his letter to the Galatians, also considers the rules, in this case as written in the law. He explains the need for the law essentially to help people behave well towards one another. But if we follow Jesus, he says, we shouldn't really need these rules about how to act. If we are truly rooted in Christ, the one who brings the ultimate in peace and reconciliation, then we too should have that commitment to the mutual flourishing of each person and the whole of creation. For example, Oppression occurs when one person or group puts their own needs above those of others, like the outcast in our story. Our country has laws against slavery. Can we not see that living well off the exploitation of others isn't Christ-like? We discriminate against people who are different to us. Do we not see that we are all equal in the eyes of God? If we are one in Christ, as Paul suggests, why do we turn our backs on the plights of desperate people by putting them on a flight to Rwanda? Is that what God's kingdom looks like? It's not just about people. 
Would Christ have used up irreplaceable natural resources for his own personal gain? Would he have carelessly made and discarded chemicals and plastics, causing animals to die? No wonder autocratic authorities across the world have banned the Bible. This vision of a just and merciful kingdom is powerful stuff. So what I'm suggesting is healing isn't just about getting rid of physical ailments or finding a way through heartbreak. It isn't just the absence of things that cause mental and physical pain. In fact, it might not be those things at all. Healing is about a restored relationship with God, being able to depend on God because the awful things we experience make us see all too clearly that we can depend on him and him alone. This painful thing makes us realise we are not masters of our own universe. We are not even at the centre of the universe, though we tend to think and behave as if we are. And once the balance of attention shifts away from us, away from me, that's when we see God in other people and in other parts of creation. That's when we realise that healing and wholeness isn't just about me as an individual. One person cannot be truly restored unless the whole of humanity is restored. As Paul says in his letter to the Corinthians, if one part of the body suffers, all suffer. Can I truly be at peace when I know there are others who aren't? Especially when my actions, the society I am part of, is what deprives another of that peace. A big but important thing to think about. But what can we do about it? Well, I suggest we start by noticing what particular needs or issues in the world tug at our hearts. Bishop Rowan pointed out the importance of lament, of allowing ourselves to feel the hurt of what we witness, not to become hardened against pain and wrongs, which can happen all too easily if the issues just seem too far out of our control. So pay attention to those situations that catch your eye, the news stories that tug at your heart, the little nudges God is giving you. Pray about those situations. Ask God to show you what he wants you to do. Maybe write to your MP. Donate to a charity that provides support in that area. Volunteer a bit of time. Offer friendship to a refugee. Send a postcard to someone who's lonely. Speak up when you hear someone make racist, sexist or other derogatory comments. The little things matter as much as the big things. We all need to reorientate our lives so that we become more attuned to God's healing purpose in the world. Let's discover what he's inviting us to do, to join him in bringing about wholeness. Amen.